Okay, Peter, so kind of shock of the weekend was the Kiko Martinez victory over Kid Galahad. Uh, Kiko Martinez took the score in a big knockdown in the fifth round after being dominated for four rounds and then stopping the fight emphatically in the sixth. And, you know, obviously, there was a lot of talk before the fight about, um, you know, Kiko Beat shouldn't really be in the other corner against Kid Galahad. He was 35 years old. He had 10 losses. His best days had come a long time ago. You know, he won the IBF Super Bantamweight title in 2013, was beaten by Carl Frampton in 2014. And since then, you know, has really kind of lost to all the top guys at Super Bantam and Feather. Um, and so really, you know, the, the saying was that he had, had, why on earth he wasn't ranked by anybody but the IBF after a sort of, you know, surprise one-off one -off victory a while ago. So why was he in the opposite corner against Kid Galahad? And this was a real, a gimme fight for Galahad. It obviously turned out not to be that. Um, and it was just interesting to me. It just made me think, you know, this is the away fighter comes in. And this is sometimes the great thing about boxing. You know, one of the bad things is sometimes you get the home and away fighter and it's too predictable who's going to win. It's too predictable, you know, going in, you almost know the result of the fight before the first bell has started. Um, and we also had another upset on that card when Terry uh, Harper suffered her first uh, pro defeat to Alicia Baumgartner and lost her WBC title in the fourth round. And so again, away fighters coming in and taking that victory, and it you know kind of makes for, makes boxing exciting, um, you know, and, and, and makes it happen. But I thought, you know, to be a bit patriotic, I thought, you know, it just got me thinking about the best five or the top five victories um, of British fighters going away as the away fighter abroad and and winning. And so I thought I'd run through my personal top five. So if anybody objects to these, um, you know, I'm just going to go through them. They're a personal selection um, for various reasons that I'll outline. So. Um, Number five is Danny Williams against Mike Tyson. Now, people might not think this is a major victory because it wasn't for a major title. So this is June 2004, um, but it's a personal favourite. Uh, so basically, Tyson was still Tyson in these days. This was 2004. He had lost to Lennox Lewis in 2002, um, but then he came back and fought Clifford Etienne, got rid of him in 49 seconds. There was talk of a Lewis rematch. Um, and, you know, Tyson said, I need a couple of tune-up fights. Then Lewis beat Vitaly Klitschko and then retired. So there was talk of uh, Tyson against Vitaly Klitschko. Um, and in the meantime, Tyson thought he'd take a tune-up. So he fought this. Nobody had ever heard of Danny Williams in America. So he brought in Danny. Danny had three losses on his record. And, uh, you know, the, the, the fight was set for America. There's, there's, there's a great story about this. Talking to Jim McDonald a few years ago, I remember him saying they went to America for a two-week training camp before the fight. Um, Jim brought in some sparring partners. The main sparring partner, I can't remember his name now, but the main guy that Jim brought in said $500 a day. I want you to do three rounds a day with Danny. And uh, this sparring partner said, look, man, I'll do 10, 12 rounds a day. It's no problem. You know what I mean? I'll, I'll give you guy good work. He said, no, I want you to do three rounds a day. And I don't want you to talk to Danny Williams. Do not speak to him. If he talks to you, completely ignore him. He's got enough mates. He doesn't need any more mates. And he said, also, I'll pay you $500 a day. I've got 10 grand in cash. If you knock Danny Williams out, in those sparring sessions, you get the 10 grand. Okay, so that's the deal. So the guy said, yeah, you're, you're paying the money. That's what I do. So every day this guy came to camp, Danny would say, talk to him, say hello. He would just sneer at him, not, not, say, not do anything. And then the sparring started and he would go hell for leather at Danny, swinging everything, trying to knock him out. You know, and after three rounds, Jim would say, right, how'd you get? And Danny would say, no, 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 let's, let's do a few more. You know, and Jim would say, no, that's it, off you go. Danny came to Jim and said, I want this guy out of the camp. He's ignorant, he's stupid, he comes in every day trying to knock my head off. I want rid of him. And Jim said, no, no, it's good sparring, Danny, let's do it. Let's just let's keep with him. Anyway, they did keep with him. Of course, what happens when the fight comes? Tyson will not speak to Danny. He's surly, you know, he sneers at him. And of course, he comes running at him for three rounds. And, um, you know, it looked like Danny was going to go in the first round. He, he was staggered twice, had to hold um, in the second round. Uh, you know, pretty much the same, although Danny did manage to get in some blows of his own. You know, in the, in the third round, Danny was starting to come into the fight a bit, but he was deducted two points. So basically, he'd lost the first three rounds convincingly. He came out in the fourth round. Tyson's fire had gone out. You know, Jim McDonald was bang on the money. Tyson was a three-round fighter. If he didn't get you out of there, and Danny was conditioned to not be got out of there through that sparring, um, Danny took over. Massive unanswered barrage in the fourth, and Danny Williams won the nine-to-one underdog that nobody ever heard of effectively ended Mike Tyson or the, the, the myth of Mike Tyson there and then. Um, you know, Danny went on to fight Vitaly Klitschko, um, you know, and got stopped in the eighth round uh, after that fight. And Tyson went on to fight Kevin McBride um, and, you know, and then just call it a day after that. But effectively, it was the shattering, the end of the myth of Tyson. And it, it was an amazing win for Danny. And like I say, a personal favourite of mine. Um, so that, that I put in at number five. Number four, I put Nigel, Gen Nigel Ben versus Doug DeWitt. Now, this was April 1990. And as you know, Nigel Ben's been down here, Peter, a few times. You know, he's quite a favourite of mine, and we've talked about this fight. So Ben had lost to Watson, 
Um, you know, after having been knocking everybody out, then he lost to Watson. You know, he looked like he'd basically, you know, when he couldn't blow people away, anybody that was a bit more technical boxer was going to take care of him. His chin looked a bit suspect. You know, effectively, Watson ended that fight with a jab. Instead of going for the rematch, Ben went to America to try and rebuild, got a shot against Doug DeWitt. Now, Doug DeWitt was a tough guy. You know, he was uh, he was very experienced. He was kind of iron chinned. He'd been against, in against all the top people. He'd just uh, won the newly minted WBO middleweight title. And he took on Ben, and Ben was a big underdog in this fight. You know, it was really a kind of shit or bust thing for Ben uh, to kind of gate crash the world stage or uh, just be seen as someone that, you know, who who really the Watson, you know, the Watson fight uh, would, would underline that he wasn't really a world, world-class world fighter. So he fought Doug DeWitt, um, went in, you know, it was a great, it was a cracking fight. It's really worth watching on YouTube. Um, they're both really going for it. They both land left hooks uh, simultaneously early on, and Ben is down. Uh, but Ben comes storming back. And, uh, you know, he, he finally scores an eighth round KO and he is now, you know, established on the world stage. He's got that world title. Um, uh, DeWitt only went on to fight one more time. Ben went on to uh, beat up Iran Barkley in the next fight, which really, you know, established himself. Then he came over to take care of one little bit of unfinished business uh, with Chris Eubank. And we know what happened there. So, uh, you know, I mean, but, but this was the really establishment of Nigel Ben on the world stage. It was a big risk to go to fight an established guy like Doug DeWitt and, and it came off for him. In my list, John H. Tracy against Joseph Napolis. Now, this is the this is the only one on here that is kind of a bit before my time. This was this was December 1975. Um, but a big fan of John H. You know, it's well worth watching the fight. So John H. went to Mexico City to fight an established champion in Joseph Napolis. Joseph Napolis has been raining on and off for about six years. Um, it was in a ball ring in Mexico City in stifling heat. So, you know, the, the, the boy from Bethnal Green wasn't really expected to last the course. One, with such a quality operator, and two, you know, in that stifling heat in the afternoon heat in that bull ring. The atmosphere was supposed to be amazing. 40,000 fanatical Joseph Annapolis fans in Mexico City screaming for Stracy's blood. I'm told reliably there were 23 Londoners that made it um, against those 40,000. Um, and, you know, as first off, it looked like it was going to go kind of to, to, to the way it was supposed to go. Um, you know, he was down in the first round, John H. Um, but he managed to fight his way back into the fight. It made it quite a brutal, quite a physical fight. At the end of the sixth round, Napoli's eye was closing, went back to his stall and didn't come out for the seventh. And John H. Tracy was world champion. Again, a big risk for him to go abroad. You know, he was European champion at that point. But it had a few losses on his record. Big risk to go there and take that chance. And it came off and he became WBC um, you know, world, world champion. Um, number two, more recent times, November 2015, Tyson Fury against Vladimir Klitschko. Um, you know, this was an amazing victory and it's kind of somewhat overshadowed by Tyson's descent afterwards and then his amazing return. But, you know, if we look back to 2015 when he really first established himself on the world stage, Vladimir Klitschko had, had a 10 year reign, um, you know, really since, uh, to, since beating Chris Burton in 2006, uh, early 2006, to, to, to win his first world heavyweight title. You know, had cleaned out the division multiple times, really. You know, the only fighter that really could stand with him was his brother, who was never going to fight and was now retired. So Klitschko stood alone and stood high. Um, you know, and Fury came in and it was seen as, you know, he's not, he's not, he's obviously not going to win this. You know, it's just going to be another one that, that, that Klitschko bowls over. Um, Fury was never intimidated. It was interesting how he, he he really didn't play the game with Klitschko. You know, the Klitschkos were kind of notorious for doing everything professionally, doing everything well, being very polite. You came and fought on their K2 promotion show in a big football stadium in Germany. You know, they called all the shots and they got the victory. Um, and, and and Tyson didn't really want to play along with that. You know, he wasn't playing second fiddle. He, he I think he did kind of get in Vladimir's head a little bit um, before the fight and even right up to the fight, you know, on the day of the fight, um, Fury was like, no, I'm not happy with the gloves. I'm not. I'm not fighting if we're fighting those gloves. I want different gloves. Um, then there was a load of, you know, uh, shenanigans about the underlay uh, foam under the ring. Again, they were like, no, we're not coming out unless you remove two inches of that foam under the ring because that they thought was designed to slow Tyson down because they they thought their advantage was speed of foot uh, with Tyson as it proved to be. So the underlay under the ring was removed. And finally, all their demands were met. He came out and was absolutely inspired. I mean, you know, Tyson Fury beat Vladimir Klitschko that night with feints. You know, it was amazing. The head movement was incredible. And, and Vladimir just couldn't get that jab going, couldn't get it connecting, which meant for Vladimir, he couldn't fire his right hand. And so, um, you know, Tyson, although, you know, a lot, a lot of the fight was feints and slips and, and movement. Tyson's movement was incredible. You know, he was switching and he just seemed to bamboozle Klitschko, um, you know, and cruised his way to, to a unanimous decision victory. Um, and then, you know, we know the Tyson story for, for, 
from there, you know, and, and, and incredible as it is and still going. But uh, that was a really amazing night, you know, and an incredible thing to go to an established champion's backyard and beat him convincingly, you know, um, in that backyard. But number one for me uh, through this list, and this is one I do remember, September 1986, Lloyd Hunnigan against Donald Curry. Now, this Donald Curry at this time was you know, almost unsurpassed, talked about being the pound for pound number one. He was world welterweight champion, unified world welterweight champion. In those days, that meant WBC, WBA and IBF. And he had won that at a canter. You know, he had beaten guys, stopped guys like Milton McCrory, um, and Marlon Starling. You know, he had absolutely wiped the floor with these guys, but it looked like he wasn't even hardly trying. There was talk about Donald Curry moving up in weight from welterweight to middleweight and fighting Marvin Hagler, you know, to give him a challenge. Because it seemed that, you know, so... You know, so obvious there were some rumours that he was struggling at the welterweight limit. Um, but anyway, in the meantime, he was going to fight a manager to challenge with Lloyd Hunnigan. Uh, so Lloyd Hunnigan was a massive underdog, came over with Mickey Duff, given absolutely no chance. But again, a bit like Tyson, just had this incredible confidence. And, you know, all the time we're talking about, no, I'm going to win, I'm going to win. Everybody wrote him off. The press wrote him off. You know, all the bookies wrote him off. All the Vegas people wrote him off. And you've got to also remember back in this time... Uh, British and European fighters going up against top American fighters. The result was, you know, 99 times out of 100, the top American fighter won. You know, the styles were different and, um, you know, it was seen as more stand up straight, you know, sort of jab, jab style for, from the British and European fighters. And the Americans were more swarming, hooking fighters. So, you know, this was seen as, you know, something that was only going to go one way. Um, but Lloyd had different ideas. He put a load of money on, on himself uh, before the fight. And, uh, you know, I think he got eight to one with the Vegas bookies and almost put his entire purse on it. And he went for Curry from the opening round. Absolutely went for him, roughed him up, you know, ragged him around, pulled him about, you know, just, he just kept hitting him. He, he almost didn't let him in the fight. And it kind of just went one way until uh, at the end of the sixth round, uh, you know, Curry retired on his stool, um, you know, having just been absolutely beaten up for six rounds. And it was incredible. I always remember Mickey Duff jumping in the room, rolling around on the floor um, with Lloyd Hunnigan. And the weird thing is, I can remember watching that. I was, uh, I was just turned 16 at the time. And I heard the result on the news in the morning that uh, Lloyd Hunnigan had won. And I honestly thought to myself, this can't be right. And in those days, obviously, we didn't have all the pay-per-view, we didn't have anything else. And I had to watch it on BBC Grandstand later in the afternoon. So I'm watching a fight that I know the result of. It's the only way to watch it. And I literally was thinking, they must have got this wrong on the news. This can't unfold in this way. Such was the sort of magnitude of Curry. And so I watched that fight unfold, almost not believing that the result was going to be as, as I'd been told until I actually saw it with my own eyes. So that, to me, was the best victory um, for a British fighter abroad. I just thought that was a little recap. You know, I know Kiko Martinez's victory is, is the topical thing, Peter, but I just thought I'd recap, you know, when the away fighter goes away and give it a bit of interest, a bit of patriotic interest, when it's the British fighter that goes away and all these amazing victories that we've had. And it you know, reminds us of the beauty of boxing and sometimes the unpredictability of boxing, you know, which makes it so compelling. Um, you know, that these guys can can come in as the underdog and can score the victories. So, you know, um, I, you know, overall, I think it was good for boxing, even if it was bad for British boxing. But Kid Galahad will come again. I'm sure ready to sort the rematch out. And um, yeah, it's all good. Another, another great weekend of boxing. And a little bit of reminiscing from me. Cheers, Peter.